Hey guys, this is Yom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we will be talking about the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway. I have been a Berkshire Hathaway shareholder for various years and have also been to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting in the past. Today, we'll briefly go over two ways of finding the intrinsic value of the company. The first is how the business schools look at the intrinsic value, which is you first find the weighted average cost of capital and use that as the discount rate to find the net present value of the future cash flows of a business. And the second method is just by picking the discount rate that suits your investment philosophy and use that to find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review the two ways of finding the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at how business schools teach to find the intrinsic value of the company. Over here, I pasted Berkshire Hathaway's cash flow from operations and capital expenditure that I got from MarketWatch. Next, I looked at the company's interest expense. This is also a number that I got from MarketWatch. Berkshire Hathaway's tax rate is about 22%, so its post-tax interest rate came to about $3.2 billion. After that, I looked at the average of the change in cash over the past five years, which came out to about $3.9 billion. Finally, the company's free cash flow comes out to the addition of cash flow from operations plus capital expenditure plus interest expense post-taxes minus change in cash, which comes out to about $59.8 billion. The next step is to look up the company's short-term expected growth rate, which analysts expect that to be about 7%. After that, inputting Berkshire Hathaway's perpetual growth rate, which is going to be the same as the 30-year treasury bond yield, which is about 1.91%. The fourth step is to find the company's weighted average cost of capital. For this, we're going to calculate the company's weighted average cost of capital. The first step in the process is to input the company's interest-bearing debt under current liabilities, which is about $14 billion. Next is the interest-bearing debt under long-term liabilities, which is about $114 billion. The total debt comes out to about $128.22 billion. Next, looking at the company's equity capital, we know that the company's current stock price is about $294.6 per share. The company's total equity, which is the market cap, is about $659.37 billion. So the company's shares outstanding number comes out to about $2,238 million. Berkshire Hathaway's total capital is going to be the addition of the company's total debt plus its total equity, which is about $787.6 billion. When we look at the proportion of the company's total debt to its total capital, it's about 16.3%, and the company's total equity to its total capital is about 83.7%. The next step is to go on the Finder Bond Screener and look at Berkshire Hathaway's bond rating. The S&P gave Berkshire Hathaway credit rating of AA. The next step is to go on the Fred Economic Data website and look at the option adjusted spread for a AA rated company, which is about 0.65%. Next, we input the company's risk-free rate, which is the 30-year treasury yield, which is about 1.91%. And finally, the company's before-tax cost of capital comes out to about 2.56%, which is the addition of the company's option adjusted spread plus the risk-free rate. In short, the company's before-tax cost of capital is about 2.56%. Now that we have the company's cost of debt capital down, let's look at the company's cost of equity capital. The first thing we have to find is the equity beta. For this, we're going to use the information that Ashwa Damodaran has collected over the years through his research. We know that Berkshire Hathaway's total debt compared to its total capital is about 16.28%. Berkshire Hathaway's tax rate is about 22.34%. I got this information by dividing the company's taxes by its pre-tax income. Finally, I inputted the unleveraged beta corrected for cash using the information that Ashwa Damodaran provided in his Excel sheet for the insurance for property casualty business, which was about 0.70. When I inputted this information, the company's leverage adjusted bottom-up beta came out to about 0.81. We take this information onto our weighted average cost of capital where we were trying to find the company's cost of equity capital. Next, I inputted the company's market risk premium to be about 6%. Ever since 2011, the market risk premium has fluctuated between 5.3 to 5.7%. So I'm rounding up the company's market risk premium to be 6%. The risk-free adjusted rate, which is the 30-year treasury yield, is about 1.91%. So Berkshire Hathaway's cost of equity capital, which is going to be the multiplication of equity beta times the market risk premium, plus the risk-free rate, which comes out to about 6.744%. Now that we have found the company's cost of debt and its cost of equity, we sum it all together to find the company's cost of total capital. The company's tax rate is about 22%. So Berkshire Hathaway's after-tax cost of debt is going to be 1 minus the tax rate times its before-tax cost of debt capital, which is 1 minus the tax rate times 2.56, which comes out to about 1.988%. The company's percent debt is about 16.3%. 
Next, we look at what the company's cost of equity capital was, which is 6.744%, which is the number that we just calculated here. We multiply that by the company's percent equity, which is about 83.7%. We multiply these two numbers. And in short, the company's weighted average cost of capital is going to be the multiplication of number one times number two plus number three times number four, which comes out to about 5.97%. So this is how we got the step four in our free cash flow valuation sheet, where the cost of capital comes out to about 5.97%. Step five is to look at the value of operations. Over here, we expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 7% every year for the next five years. After the five-year mark into perpetuity, we expect the company's free cash flow to grow at its perpetual growth rate, which is about 1.91%. And the formula that we use to find the terminal value is the company's free cash flow times 1 plus its perpetual growth rate divided by the company's weighted average cost of capital minus its perpetual growth rate. Once we have all these free cash flows in hand, we look at the company's net present value which is going to be the company's discount rate, the same as the company's weighted average cost of capital. And then we look at the, all the expected free cash flows that we're going to get in the future. So the company's value of operations comes out to about $1.8 trillion. And just to give you a perspective, the company's market cap right now is about $660 billion. The next step is to look at Berkshire Hathaway's non-operating assets and debt capital. Over here, I inputted the company's value of non-operating assets, which is its marketable securities that I got from the company's most recent 10Q, which came out to about $310.739 billion. The company's total debt, as we know, is about $128.22 billion. Next, we look at Berkshire Hathaway's fundamental balance sheet representation, its non-operating assets, which the lion's share of its non-operating assets is its marketable securities portfolio, which amount to about $310 billion. Next, the company's operating assets amount to about $1.8 trillion. On the other side, we have the total debt, which is about $128 billion. And the company's shareholders' equity is going to be the addition of the net present value of its operating assets, plus its non-operating portfolio, minus its total debt, which comes out to about $2 trillion. Finally, the company's per share price for its intrinsic value is going to be the company's equity portion divided by the shares outstanding, which comes out to about $896 per share. And the company's current stock price is about $295 per share. The last step is to stress test the intrinsic value that we got for Berkshire Hathaway. We vary the company's short-term growth rate that analysts expect to be 7%. We vary between 10% and 4%. And we vary the company's long-term growth rate, which right now is about 1.91% to about 1.41 to 2.41%. We can see that in the extreme situation where the company's short-term growth rate is 4% and its long-term growth rate is 1.41%, the company's intrinsic value is about $726 per share. And in the polar opposite, where the company's short-term growth rate is 10% and the company's long-term growth rate is 2.41%, Berkshire Hathaway's intrinsic value was about $1,126 per share. Both Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say that trying to find the intrinsic value of the company by focusing on the weighted average cost of capital is not really the right method, as weighted average cost of capital takes into account the company's beta, and beta takes into account the volatility of the stock price, and volatility is not the same thing as risk. So now let's look at the way Warren Buffett likes to approach the company's intrinsic value, which is just focusing on the company's discount rate rather than focusing on the company's weighted average cost of capital. Over here, I pasted Berkshire Hathaway's chilling 12-month free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was at $29,432 million. I'm expecting the company's annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 7%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 7% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. Now, the discount rate is going to vary based on the investor. For example, Joe Greenblatt always uses 6% as his discount rate. Warren Buffett used a discount rate of 10% back when the treasuries were yielding 7%, implying a 3% margin of safety on top of the treasury rate. Charlie Munger likes to look at everything from an opportunity cost standpoint. So if you find an investment that's going to give you a 10% return, you better have a discount rate of 10% for any and all investments that you're looking in the future. And as we saw earlier, business schools like to use the company's weighted average cost of capital as its discount rate. I like to use 10% as I'm always thinking about rule of 70, where it gives me an idea of how many years will it take me to double my investment. And when I use a 10%, it implies that 70 divided by 10 would be seven years. So after seven years, I would double my investment. And that to me is the bare minimum, the threshold, the hurdle rate for me in order to make any investment. Next is the long-term growth rate, which is in line with the 30-year treasury yield, which is about 2%. Next, Berkshire Hathaway has 2,292 million shares outstanding and has a long-term debt of about $113,547 million. 
We also know that Berkshire Hathaway's assets also include its marketable securities, which amount to about $310 billion. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $317.5 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $294.5 per share, we can see that the company's stock is trading about 7% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $254 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year market in perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $530 billion. To this number, we add the marketable portfolio and subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $317.5 per share. Now, if you disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that Berkshire Hathaway is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $197 per share. If you disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that Berkshire Hathaway is going to grow into perpetuity, so there's no point for the company to worry about paying off its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $367 per share. And finally, if we disregard the company's marketable portfolio, then we get the intrinsic value without the marketable securities to be about $182 per share. Now, if we drop the company's discount rate to the weighted average cost of capital that we computed earlier, which was about 6%, we can see that the intrinsic value bounces up. And in this case, the company's current stock price is about 50% below the company's intrinsic value. However, a 6% discount rate would imply that I would be doubling my money in 12 years, which is not acceptable to me as I want my investment to double in seven years, in which case my intrinsic value is going to stay at about $317.5 per share. Hey guys, hopefully you found this video interesting on how we go about calculating Berkshire Hathaway's intrinsic value using the company's free cash flows. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should view next, please leave it in the comment section below. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.